Yes, hello, folks. Welcome to a very special episode of the Manchester United Podcast. We are United Podcast. I am delighted to be joined with a gentleman who most Manchester United fans will be aware of. Um, Nora Dean, of course. Uh, I've known him as Bearded Genius from our digital relationship. Goes back a long time from the Red Ash Free Sanctuary. Um, someone that uh, I found both extremely interesting, politically sound, uh, funny, very talented, who covers a lot of different things, a lot of in life, whether it's sport, whether it's politics. Um, and I'm here to talk to him about his fantastic book, Inshallah United. I haven't had a chance to read it all the way through, but what I have read of it so far and the reviews that I've read of it so far, it's fantastic. It's brilliant. Highly recommend it. Uh, I'll post links to where you can get the book at the end of it. So, first of all, Nurudin, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm doing good. How are you? All good, mate. All good. It mm-hmm. seems like I've known you digitally for, must be, 20, close to 20 years. We've changed a lot in that time. Uh, Red Issue Sanctuary was a, a brutal forum. For, um, yeah. It was, uh, didn't suffer fools gladly, at, uh, but it was a brilliant community. Do you, are you still part of it? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, but um, no, I think I think you're completely right. I think um, it's. I think I think when when you when you kind of make your way on social media and then you gain mm. you gain a bit of notoriety on 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 social media, it's very. I think it's very easy to get a bit of an ego about it and to sure. think you, you th- to think you're something special. And yeah. uh, I think um, I think in, in terms of of a bit of a finishing school. Uh, to knock yourself down a bit in terms of your ego, I think this. I think the sank was good in that respect because, like you say, they if if anyone got a bit up themselves, they they weren't having it, and uh, yeah, it kept you humble and it <laughs> and it kept you honest. So uh, I think uh, that's a microcosm of British culture in general. That uh, yeah. if you ever get too above yourself, you know, you, you you'll get brought back down to earth. You'll be reminded you didn't have an arse in your trousers when they first yeah. met you. You know. Um, do you um do, do you do you find that that's different in the states? Yes, and, very different. And over here, is it? Yeah. So one of the reasons why it's very different here, um, in the UK, there's very different. Very, most people are very similar socioeconomic status. There's very little variance between people. You know, most people in a classroom are going to be of a similar you know background in terms of you know the the you. Know, the, the privilege and status that you have, the, how much money you make. But here, the, the variance can be broad. You know, you could have a kid in the classroom where their parents are making 50 grand a year and, and another kid making 5 million a year. So there's really no symmetry between the working class experience. It's just so broad. So, you know, whereas back home, you know, you come from these small, you know, enclave neighborhoods where, you, you, no one was growing up in a five million dollar mansion, you know, but that can happen here, right? So, you know, you're always reminded of your propinquity to the working class, and that you're never above that. But here, you know, and I don't think that's healthy here because, um, you know, it um, inevitably leads to values being placed on humans based on their um, income and job status and. Um, and he's starting to see that, unfortunately, back home. But yes, it's it's very different here. But um, I want to talk to you about your book, Made in Salah United. United. Um, tell me a little bit about that. I want you to tell me about yourself, uh, your background, and uh, what was the inspiration behind this book? Um, well, I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, I needed a bit of convincing to write the book in the first place because the, uh, the publishers um, approached me and kind of, Approached the possibility of writing a book, and obviously the the first thing that goes through your head when someone suggests that is is again talking about ego. Like your ego kicks in, and you kind of think, oh, wouldn't it be great to write a book? Uh, you're very flattered, but then certainly for me, um, I didn't want to do something or enter into something that uh, I didn't feel sure about because, and again, like the, the thing with writing a book is it's such a it's such a big undertaking, um, and and I was doing it. Um, outside of my day job so it mm-hmm. basically meant not having much of a life um while I was doing it so I, I didn't want to do something I wasn't proud of and and and, and you all know as well as me that there's a million books out there about United so mm-hmm. and, and especially the Fergie era so then you kind of so then I was thinking what is the point of yet another book what is the point of a yet another book about that time and that place 
and um, growing up in that era, um, that's not already been said. So I, I kind of said no at first, but then speaking to the um, speaking to the publishers, um, we kind of got to the point where they said, "Well, it's it's less about it's less about what happened, and it's more about how you experienced what happened." And it's kind of, it's kind of what you were pointing to. Um, we, we had a brief chat before the uh, before we started recording, and, it, and it's that thing of um, I I knew that if I could get into the mind frame of being a kid and how that felt, then then at least I'd be able to give a unique perspective. And yeah. also, also like like I suppose I had that um, experience of of being like a second generation Pakistani kid. Uh, both parents came from Pakistan. English was not their first language. Uh, they they had to start from scratch here. We had no family, and uh, and also the thing about being a Muslim and being working class and um, and I think what that does and you, I mean you, you, you'll you, you'll have experienced this as well with your heritage and and and, and, and sort of where you've travelled to different places and set, settled in different places. You um, if you're if you're not automatically part of somewhere. Then, then there's a part of you that really mm. wants to um, be part of that and fit in. And especially as a kid, um, you desperately want to feel a part of things, knowing that you're different and being and sort of constantly being reminded. Of different. So um, that's where yeah. that's where something like football is such an amazing thing. It's it, 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 mm -hmm. it's that thing of like it feels like such an irrelevant thing. Like it's just a sport. Why would why should we care this much? Why should you and I, as as grown up adults, mm -hmm. care so much about these these millionaires, multimillionaires who don't know who we are? But it's that thing of, of it's not about that. It's about feeling part of something and feeling connected. And as soon as I latched onto football and and got into football, like I, I felt part of something. I, I I felt part of um. And again, like it, it's so wonky in this day and age. Like you know the sort of the whole thing on Twitter and social media where it's all like MUSC family and it's all so lame mm. and sort of superficial, but like it genuinely felt as if you were part of something and almost part of a family as well. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting points there. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, when you have a different identity um, and you want to be accepted, it's a bit of, it's a bit complex because you're constantly told you need to assimilate, but you're reminded every day that you're not the same. And so it's very difficult to find a space where, you know, you retain your identity, but you're also accepted because your identity is very important to you. And, um, you know, you're writing a book from uh, your own perspective, but it's a perspective shared by many that transcends identity. I mean, some of the language that you've used in here is exactly how I would describe the same experience through my eyes as a child, whether we have similar backgrounds or not. Um, but I also think it is important, Nordin, for Muslim kids, you know, who probably in this day and age face more, you know, prejudice and discrimination um, than probably most other people uh, and are, um, that, that they too, you know, have people exactly like them that write people, that write books like this from their perspective that says, you are, um, you are as much a part of this as anyone else, and that your identity is is not pejorative. It's perfectly fine, and that this is really, really important. As a kid coming from Belfast over to England to watch United, I was really concerned because I was worried about what was I going to experience. You know, were English people going to hate me? And I was worried about that. And um, one of the things that's attracted me to United was that the United fans always seem to have a sense of social justice, of inclusivity that I never experienced any, you know, insult or anything that made me feel unwelcome or that my identity was something that um, I needed to be ashamed of or embarrassed about or, or to pretend that I wasn't. And, you know, there are certain clubs that don't have that. Did you experience that as a United fan where you always felt um, that your identity was uh, not relevant to, the, to to how you were accepted. Completely, that's that's exactly how I felt. Um, and, and and the funny thing is that um, because growing up when I did and and having the parents that I did, my my parents obviously when the first generation comes over from another country, like in in my case, both parents came over from Pakistan. They mm -hmm. had to face the national front. 
Yeah. Dead Space, the the BMP. And they I think I think what that does to you psychologically is it makes you it makes you um almost live within within yourself. So you mm. never want to stand out. Yeah. You never want to get you, you never want uh to garner any attention. And you almost um get into this uh, mind frame of like keep your head down, like mm-hmm. if no one pays attention, that's good because that means no one's gonna no one's gonna attack you, no one's gonna um paint horrible things on your on your on your house, no one's gonna um shout abuse at you for wearing a headscarf or whatever or having a beard. So 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 that's the mind mind frame they had. And as as second generation um immigrants, you you take a bit of that on board, but then mm-hmm. you kind of you kind of do want to stand out and you do want to make your mark and 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 you've got that extra little bit of confidence of like I I do belong here to a certain extent. Mm. Um and and whereas whereas from my from my parents it was a case of they were Pakistani and they'd come over from to Manchester. For me it was I had Pakistani heritage and I was proud of that Pakistani heritage, but I was Mancunian. I was born in Manchester. I'm Mancunian and 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 like I, I grew up with that sense and going to games, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a struggle to get to go because my parents weren't into football, so they didn't quite understand why I was so obsessed. But also in terms of going to games and getting permission to go to games and that would only happen if if somebody's dad was going or, or somebody's parents could take me with with another kid. It was a case of they were still nervous because they'd grown up or, or, or they'd sort of like um, got used to a situation where if there's any situation where there's there's it's it's a, it's a majority white sort of crowd and you are you are in a very small minority of brown people, mm-hmm. they their experiences told them that that's dangerous. Yes, of course. So they were very nervous about me going to football games. And also, the thing is, no one lives in um, in a vacuum. So the whole horrendous sort of um, propaganda that, like, the Thatcher government and mm-hmm. the right-wing papers, like, essentially painted football fans as, as animals mm-hmm. and and hooligans and, and, and uh, a lot of that sort of spilled into the rhetoric around Hillsborough where, where, the, where the fans were blamed because fans were seen yeah. as... As subhuman, mm-hmm. um, so so my parents like like they would, they sort of consumed that that sort of message. So so that almost sort of fed into their their sort of like fear of like me going to games because they they all they'd heard was like hooligan football hooligans, um, all, always causing trouble. But uh, going to actual games, my experience, like you say, was completely different. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was almost this this sense of if you're a red, you're one of us. It does yeah. not matter. It does not matter. Your accent doesn't matter. Your your skin color doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're from. Like if you're a red, you're a red. And mm-hmm. and and it, and it kind of feels it kind of feels utopian to sort of describe it in those terms when you know that sort of um, football bleeds into real life and real life bleeds into football. So so as many dickheads as you'll have in society, you'll you'll have at games and vice versa. Mm-hmm. But there was this sense of you are one of us and and that 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 was so powerful to me and 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 it, and, it, and I felt accepted in a way that I didn't yeah anywhere else and and, it, and it's like um i mean it's, i suppose like even with you like like um immediately when you, when you opened your mouth people would have known where you're from yes and and also the the thing with the thing with sort of anti irish um prejudice and racism is and xenophobia is that I think people forget how recent it was. I think people just assume now that that Irish people um, are just accepted in part of society and and they don't have a problem in England. Whereas it was in my, it was definitely in my lifetime where where Irish people um, were horrible horrible sort of like uh, assumptions about sort of any time there was any sort of similar to sort of my experience sort of now and later on about any time there's a terrorist sort of attack, mm-hmm. is it Muslims? Like, mm-hmm. like yeah. not long, not long ago, it's like, like anyone with an Irish accent would be blamed. No, listen. When I would go through airports, Heathrow, whatever, London, about you know, being young, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, you know, when you heard about that, you know, the random screening, right? Which clearly was not random. I mean, I remember going through this, having you know, carry on 
gifts being broken, being smashed and stuff, and having all sorts of insults leveled at me. But you know, I think that um, there's a certain segment of any country that has that. Um, but, but one of the things that was really interesting for me in this whole experience was the segregation that I was experiencing in Belfast, religious uh, and nationalistic segregation stopped the minute I got on the bus to go to United. Um, it was weird because I hadn't experienced this many times. Uh, the, the, the segregation of you're Catholic, you're Protestant, you're a nationalist, you're a unionist stopped the minute we got on the coach to go to Old Trafford. That is where the assimilation happened, where it didn't matter what you were, a Catholic person, we were all United fans. And in many ways, especially, you know, it's different now because your social and political influences are on the internet. But when you're growing up, when we were growing up with pre-internet, your, your social political views are shaped by the influences around you, your parents, your culture, your experience, your, your, your community. So in many ways, these inclusive environments that United offered went a long way to change my perspective of other people that was no question as a consequence of the environment that I was growing up in we would have been biased and prejudiced. Then all of a sudden you see people instead of reading about people, instead of hearing about people and your lived experience is totally different. And that went a long way to uh, changing my views to being, um, okay, you know what? These people I've been told are monsters are not monsters. They're exactly like me. And, in a small place like Belfast, I wasn't getting that experience. I had to go to somewhere like Manchester United. Fans were, you know, masses, you know, community diaspora all over the world. But going to Manchester where there was no segregation, there was no division of identity. It was just like you said, we're all United fans. No, no, that's that's exactly it. And, and it's that... Um... It's that sense of, um, and again, like it's the history of Manchester United. I, I know we can look at it from with like rose tinted glasses, yeah. um, and I, I mean, Lord knows, like, like if if you, funnily enough, like like it, it wasn't until the the internet and social media that I kind of realised that not all United fans were sort of socialist and sort of like uh, yes. sort of um, flying both kinds of red flag. Like, it, like um, I, I realised there was there was racist United fans, there was a uh, right wing United fans, and, and and that was that was a bit of a shock in its own. But um, I think the reason why the match experience and the general sense around United fandom was so um, inclusive, it, it has a lot to do with how it's a global. It's a global club, and and in terms of fan base, and a lot of that goes back all the way back to uh, the Busby Babes, the, the the Munich tragedy, and 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 the way that that galvanised people around the world to sort of um, have an affinity with this club that was that was um, in in a lot of senses was just another back then it was just another club that was in in the northwest of England, but um, things like that, things like being the first. Um, the first uh, English club to win the European Cup, um, the story of Matt Busby um, building a team and then building a team again. Um, it all sort of built into this mythology that made it a global club. And what that means, and like you say, it's, it's that thing of if you go to games, you are going to see people from everywhere. You're going to see people from all around the world. And in a way, it's quite humbling. Um, you, uh, I think especially on social media and especially uh, um, People who who kind of support United online rather than sort of um, mm -hmm. at games, they they can almost be quite disparaging of like um, foreign fans and mm -hmm. almost as if they're lesser fans. Whereas like in a, in a lot of senses they they're, they're bigger fans because they make more more sacrifices. They they sort of um, they they'll, they'll wake up at, at like uh, obscene hours to watch United and and. That makes them more passionate in in my eyes. So you you definitely you definitely saw that at games, like you say, and um, and yeah, and it and it's funnily enough, like it feeds into part of what motivated me to write the book because, like you say, if you'd have, if you'd have stayed in Belfast, your your sort of um, outlook of the world would be different. Yes. It doesn't matter. It, it it doesn't matter how how good a person you are. It doesn't matter how open your heart is. Um, you are still sort of um, uh, built from your experiences, and 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 you, and you would have a very sort of well, a relatively more myop myopic uh, view of the world. 
And um, so in writing this book, uh, there was there was kind of two things that I, 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 I hoped would happen. One was that that like a, a Muslim kid or like um, the, the version of me as a kid now would sort of see a book written by a Muslim and 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 it's and it's proudly called Inshallah United. There's like a Muslim word yes. in the title, and that would sort of inspire them to sort of like think, well, why can't I write a book? Why can't I do yes. something? Why, why can't I sort of um, achieve something like that? So, so, so that that was that was one of the intentions, and the the other intention, which is which is just important for me, is that if you look at Brexit, or if you look at any sort of polling, or you, you look at any sort of uh, opinion, sort of like. Uh, uh, opinions that are um, sort of collected about um, refugees and or Muslims or anything, mm. where you'll get the most prejudice are the people who haven't come in contact with them. It's like what you were saying. Yeah. So, in a way, um, you can't fully blame those people for thinking the way they do because all they know about Muslims, all they know about refugees, all they know about um, these different kinds of people, the, the, the people that they see different to them. Is what they read, what they see in the news, what they, what the Daily Mail says on on, on the front cover, what the Daily Telegraph says. So, what what I what I what I was hoping is that is that like some of these people who have never met a Muslim, sort of would pick up this book as a, as as a book about football, and then it would almost sort of like it would almost be like a stealth education to them in terms of like. Uh, I'm writing the book about United, but from the point of view of a Muslim kid. And what I'd hope is that, like, if they've never met a Muslim and then they read the book, it, it sort of, even in a small way, small way, makes them think, actually, I'm not that different from this, kid, 100%. this guy. 100%. So, because I think one of the things you also have to do, um, Nordin, is for young Muslim kids to not think, you know what, I, I have to, uh, you know, uh, raise my identity to be accepted as the United Fund. So instead of that, I could say, you know what, I'm a proud Muslim and it's completely compatible with being a Manchester United Fund. You don't have to pretend, you know, that I'm a secular Muslim or that, you know, this is that I have to, you know, suppress my identity for fear, you know, of delegitimizing myself for saying that it's not commensurate with being a Manchester United Fund. These you know, there's plenty of books on Irish Reds. There's plenty of books on other identities that, you know, are completely compatible with Manchester United. And I think if you're a young Muslim kid, you know, I mean, you'd be thinking for me to be accepted in this community, you know, I have to suppress this identity. And, um, you know, I, I think that's really, really important. Representation matters. Perspective matters. And um, there isn't many books out there that's written from that perspective. It's also good for non-Muslims to read this and say, how do these kids see the world? You know, how is it, how does it appear to them? You know, what are the intersectional things that they're dealing with on a daily basis so I can understand the world from that perspective better rather than judging? I think a lot of prejudice comes from, you know, I think it, those uh, prejudicial views are doing from emotional heavy lifting because there's certain fears about people, there's, you know, certain insecurities about themselves that it's easy to project that pain and that anger onto someone else and say, you're the reason why. Um, and human beings have been doing this forever, but it has devastating consequences to people, even, you know, in their lived experience every day, um, be it here, be it somewhere else, and how they're dehumanized in, in the world. Let me ask you this, um, first generation immigrants of this, era um did they want you to be a football fan did they was it difficult did your mom and dad you know try to discourage you did they have to, because parents whether they're muslim catholic president doesn't matter were very idealistic from this era they had a very narrow minded view of what they wanted your their kids to be i mean even my parents were like I wish you would drop this obsession and put that energy into your schoolwork or do this, do this, be a doctor, be this, be this, be this. Um, did you face difficulty or some resistance from your parents um, about being a, an obsessed native fan? Yeah, I mean, I did. Um, it's, it's funny, though, because because um, it was slightly different in terms of how my mum dealt with it and how my dad dealt with it. Because, I mean, part of it was... Part of it was um, economic as well because sure. 
we didn't have much money. Um, we were work, we, we were absolutely sort of like working class in terms of um, in terms of the way we lived, but also like like almost like below working class in terms of like we had no mm-hmm. like 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 we we in terms of money we we had none. Like, 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 we just we, we we started from nothing. Like, we had no family or no safety net. So, if if my dad's shop didn't do well one week, like, like we were we were in trouble. And Your dad had a shop. So tell me a little bit about that. Sorry, quickly. Yeah. yeah so, 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 my my dad when my dad came over from Pakistan, he, he had various jobs. Like, um, he worked in a plastics factory. He, he worked um on buses and and various other things. But then. He he managed to open his own um, hi fi shop, so it was like it's like TV speakers and things like that. Mm. So um, so yeah, um, he 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 started that, and we and it was in a precinct, and we lived um, like above a shop within the precinct. So it was a it was it was that sort of set out. But like um, where we lived, really, it shouldn't have been. It wasn't really meant for people to live in. It was actually, I think, office space that that we kind of like made into a home. So like, um, the the roof was always leaking. Um, mm. The the landlord wasn't really interested, sort of, in terms of like um, making it hospi- hospitable for for sort of people to live. It was it was always meant to be an office. So like, we'd have like silver fish, sort of, always sort of like scurrying about the floor, and we we'd um, have damp everywhere. And 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 part of what what that meant is is that is that we grew we ended up growing up with asthma like as kids because like yeah. we mm-hmm. it wasn't a great sort of um, environment health wise to, to to live in. But the thing with the thing with football is is even even in a very kind of rudimentary way. I'm not even talking about going to games or or buying tickets for that. Like even even things like spending money on on sort of um, football boots or. Or or a kit which which felt like a lot of money back then, yeah. or or even or even weekly football magazines like that was money out of out of the family pot that we didn't really have yeah. um, for disposable things. So even that like it was a bit of a struggle because it was like okay, well if you're interested in something worthwhile, um, if it's going to help your education, if it's going to help you sort of progress and have a career, mm-hmm. then fine. But you, you we can't afford to sort of um fund this hobby and and why is this hobby becoming so big in your life why are you becoming obsessed with it and um and yeah and and, and i completely understand that feeling they had but like with my dad my dad was was very much like a strict kind of a uh, father figure who sort of basically what he say what he said when like he was quite old-fashioned like that and there was always a there was always a barrier between him and i in terms of like um getting to know each other um and I talk about that in the book towards the end where I, I kind of say, like, if he'd only lived a few more years, yeah. I kind of feel as if like I, I could have got to know him and we could have got somewhere mm. closer to being friends. But like that was that that wasn't to be. But my mum, like she obviously she was softer. She sort of like uh, she wanted me to be happy. So like she would scrimp and she, she was she was um, like save up what she could and then get me what she could. And like uh even managed to get me like a football top that we really could not afford. And it's stuff like that. That sort of, it just made me, it made me so grateful then, but like looking back, it makes me even more grateful because like, um, mm-hmm. she was, she was really like, she, she didn't have a job. She was just, uh, she was looking after the five of us in not great conditions. And she somehow like, um, let me sort of enjoy this passion that I had. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's, it's something I'll always be grateful for. It's funny because, you know, if you look at football, um, sport in general, from, you know, a, 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 you know, a macro perspective, you stand by, it makes no sense. You know, but this is true of art. You know, you go yeah. see the Mona Lisa, you could describe it as brush strokes, but yet there's something about that that makes you feel a certain way than the abstract that you can't explain. Right, that on, on, logically it makes no sense. Same with music, it provokes emotions in you. If you can hear a song today that you heard thirty years ago, it reignites all these old feelings that you felt back then when you were listening to that song as a teenager in your bedroom. And you know, I mean, we can watch clips of old football games, and it will immediately teleport you back emotionally to where you were and how you felt when you watched. No matter how many times you've watched them, I'll still watch nineteen eighties clips, and I'm trying 
puts me back to a time when life was simplistic, when I wasn't ruining moments of extreme pleasure by reminding myself I've got things I shouldn't, I've, I've got, need to be depressed about. That don't you dare enjoy this present moment because there's so much other negative shit in your life. You don't do that as a kid. You live in the moment. When we get older, we write promissory notes to ourselves to be happy. We'll be happy tomorrow. We'll be happy tomorrow. We never pay, right? It never comes because we're constantly putting it off because there's always something to be depressed about. But, but football for me, I'm, I'm going to ask you this, was a refuge for me from the poverty you know, I was growing up in, which would be described as a similar experience. You know, we had no, you know, I was running about secondhand football boots, you know, secondhand bikes for Christmas and stuff. And well, we had nothing. I mean, pretty much no um, indulgence whatsoever. Um, and, um, you know, when you get older, you become, you, you look back on that, you realize, like, you know, my mom and dad were doing everything they could. It just wasn't, you know, the alternatives. It wasn't due to lack of work ethic or anything else. It was just this, what was going on. But that brought me enormous embarrassment as a child, you know, where I felt like I wasn't as good as some of the kids that had nicer shoes, nicer clothes, that I had imposter syndrome, that it, I was always going to feel, you know, that I was, you know, I had negative self image. But football matches netted was a refuge from that because that was the one time where I wasn't really negatively comparing myself, where I could just completely enjoy what was in front of me. Um, was, was, was it similar for you in the sense that football matches netted took you out of your current situation? Absolutely, and uh, and and it's that it's that sense of because this is why this is why anything like that, like football, like music, any any kind of um, expression or passion, that's why it's so important, and and especially if it, it it's especially so important if you've not got much or your mm-hmm. or, or your life circumstances are not great because it's almost like a it's almost like a life raft in in in, in your sort of in in, in your existence. It's this thing of like when you when you're a kid, things like you say things are simple, and you kind of take pleasure in what you take pleasure in, and you don't question it. And then when you get older, you realize life is complicated, mm-hmm. and some like like some people um, experience loss. Yes. Some people experience um, sort of um, really negative relationships where they're abused. Some people. Um, experience addiction some people experience depression there's all sorts of there's all sorts of difficulties that everyone's going through in their in their own way and you kind of you almost feel guilty for caring about something like football or or sort of mm-hmm. getting lost in football yeah. but, but i think i think you almost you almost make it full circle where you kind of realize that if you are experiencing depression, if you are experiencing addiction, if you, if even if you're experiencing a family member going through addiction of some mm-hmm. sort, which is which is just as heartbreaking, if not more, mm-hmm. in, yes, in some situations, um, you you realise that life without those happy moments, life without those temporary sort of. Um, Moments of joy, moments of excitement, moments of escape. Like, what would life be if you didn't have those things? Yeah. It's, it's, mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost like if you can snatch as much happiness and feeling worthwhile and feeling part of something as you can out of life, then then that's that like your life is all the better for it. And it, 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 it's, that, it, it's that thing that your, your, your day can be shit. Your day can be sort of heartbreaking, but if you can escape into into a football game, mm-hmm. you can feel you can feel like a winner. You can feel as if you're part of that team scoring a goal. And the same way, that's why people get lost in music. They can have a, they can be having a really terrible time, and things can be devastating. Devastating things happen in their lives, and then they can just put the headphones on and listen to a bit of The Clash or David yeah. Bowie or whoever or or, or Oasis. And for that, for those three and a half minutes, they they feel as if they're in that band. They feel as if they're unbeatable. And it's and it's those things that I think once you once you really think about it and you think about life and what's important, you realize that what is important is is love and loving whether it's whether it's loving your child or or, or loving your family or 
or loving your friends or loving football or loving music. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can take as many of those moments um, out of life, then those little moments can add up. And then that means that you, that that at least that part of your life was good. Yeah, so these are the things that money can't buy. Yeah. Right? You can't buy a love for Manchester United. You can't buy a love for anything. Even when I'm coaching young kids, I tell parents all the time, you can't make somebody love something. If the kid wants to do it, they're not going to tell me, they're going to show me. If you want them to do it, forget about it. Okay, And I tell my kids the same advice. I'm like, I don't care what you do. If you want to paint pictures by the beach all day as a job and it makes you happy, fucking do that. But do not chase utility, do not chase money, do not chase job, status, none of that, because it's a it's a it's a bottomless pit. Life to me is like a dance, right? You know, the purpose is not to get somewhere or to do it quickly, it's to enjoy every step of the way. So it's you know, there, there's no destination, there's nowhere you're going, you know, and there's no check that somebody can write you that's going to emancipate you from the vicissitudes of life. You're gonna have ups, you're gonna have down to human brains hardwired to worry. But do you the, to me, you know, and I'm a recovering addict, one of the things that I learned in my addiction was the difference between happiness and pleasure. When I was taking drugs, I was chasing a temporary dopamine rush of pleasure, which is totally different to happiness. Happiness is finding spiritual and emotional nourishment in the things that you do every day. You know, you're not just going to work because you get a check at the end of it so you can pay bills. Because when you do that, you constantly do the bare minimum just not to get sacked, right? Uh, when you do something that you love, Okay. This is the difference between rowing and sailing. When you row, you know, you're doing something that you hate, you get tired, you get stranded, you get fatigued, you get burnt out, and then you have to keep rowing or you're going to drown. When you sail, when you do something that you love, your wind's always at your back, you go wherever you go, you know, you get up every day, you want to do what you're doing. And the last thing you're thinking about is the racking pants, how much I'm getting paid because the emotional satisfaction you get from doing what you love is worth billions. Right. And I speak to people that have a lot of money that are in turn will be miserable because they have, you know, the, this money is like the money is the menu, right? The food, the menu and the food are totally different. You know, the menu is, you know, it's it's arid, it has no taste, it has no color, it has no value, it has but but the 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 the, the food is where the value is. Where, where, and so to me, I think uh, people that you know, place value on human beings based on their ability to consume, you know, making a major mistake. This is why we see homeless people, illegal immigrants, you know, people are illegal immigrants that have no political capital and, you know, they're treated abhorrently because they have no capital and they have no that, money. That's that's absolutely it. And and, and like, and like oh, obviously it's not like um we've we've not spent very much time talking to each other, but like we do feel as if mm. we've known each other for, for years yeah. uh, in, in a funny sort of way. And like I I know you well enough that that you don't you don't think into in terms of like kids or family members you don't think in terms of like like are they going to make as much money as possible are they going to be as successful as possible in, in in sort of a monetary sense it's like are they happy are they going to be it. happy only thing i care about yeah that's the only thing i care about i don't my my just do something that's not hurting another human being right and what i do raise my kids is to understand different cultures, to, to, to be curious about other cultures, to learn from people, to you know, never assume a position of superiority because of any identity inferred on you, whether it's your gender, your nationality, your skin color, anything. This is these are, you know, these none of these things you're in control of, okay? And there's nothing superior about you that uh, that another human being doesn't have. Please, you know, one of the things that I love about LA is that I am surrounded by different cultures, right? And you can use that as a, as a tool of division or you can embrace that. And what I've learned from other cultures is enriched me immensely as a person and helped me overcome some of my subconscious prejudices. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm still fucked up in a lot of ways, but I don't wanna be someone that is certain in my hate because um, you know, I, 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 I've been extremely depressed in life and I can't invest emotionally in inflicting pain on someone else because I just, I just, I, I don't know. But this is one of the things that your book is really, really important about because um, 
we are constantly living in an era where culture wars are manufactured and weaponized against people. And one of the uh, biggest targets of this, of course, as we've seen recent times, is the Muslim community. And it um, feels like there's always something for the Muslim community that they have to apologize for, that they have to, you know, modify their behavior or, you know, they're being judged by the fringes. And, um, and, it, and it, it's, it, again, you know, this is also creating cultural divisions because if you're on the receiving end of that hate, it's very easy to say, then I hate you too, and then become entranced in your views and legitimize retaliation because that's what happens in a radicalized society. Again, I, I grew up with this. Um, are you concerned about that and how it's being rekindled in society and how that for young United fans? Because, well, you know, the cultural differences and influences on people now are very different than before. Are you concerned about where that could, if that could change its fan base and how it could um, affect inclusivity or do you feel that um you know it's overblown i mean it's it's, it's obviously a, a a very clear concern sort of um now and has been for the last 15 20 years in terms of um how muslims are perceived and um and how muslims are treated it's, it feels like it's getting worse it's it, it's funny because i think up until the 90s i think there's a general sense that over time things will get better like in terms of people would, would would slowly become more accepting like there was a sense that um perhaps in the 60s and 70s there was a way of life and it didn't include um uh minorities and even things like um uh sexual preference it was all hidden so people were, were sort of very used to a very homogenous sort of yeah. ideal and expectation mm -hmm. But then as people got more used to different people, interacting with different people, um, they um it would things would get better for black people, things would get better for um Muslim people, Jewish people, um mm -hmm. also all, all sorts of minorities, things would get better for people in the LGBTQ plus sort of uh, community, um, and people would get more understanding. And it felt as if that's the way we were going up until the nineties and then you realize that it's not it's not a straight line it's not a, a straight line that goes up and think and people become more accepting of uh, of people and more understanding if you just take a wider view you realize that that straight line is actually a line that goes up and down up and down so what you'll get is you'll get you'll get um a time of of like where fascism is at the ascendancy and it becomes crucial for people to fight that um, that fascist uh, element and that right wing element and that hate and that hateful element, um, both on a macro and micro level. And then you you tend to find that sort of there's a there's a backlash against that. And then people people try hard to become more understanding and and more progressive. But then slowly, if if it's not checked and you don't pay attention and, and you don't do things to stop it slowly the fear starts to rise the anger starts to rise and minorities sometimes it's a different minority start to become mm -hmm. um uh the victims of prejudice and then suddenly the, the the right wing rise up and and fascism starts again so it's cyclical rather than a straight line so so obviously at the moment uh, muslims are a treat abominable but like that's I always try and look at the, look at the positives, and 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 I think as as humans, like I think it's healthy to look at things wherever you can find the positive. Try and find the positive. So, so for instance, um, like I've been very vocal about what's like the, the, the essentially the, the the genocide that's happening in Palestine at the moment, and um, and uh, the horror that 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 Gazan people are experiencing. But then, where I can, I try and look at sort of. The positives and the positives I see is although governments and world leaders might be sort of staunchly sort of denying the fact that there's a that there's a, a genocide happening, normal people care. Normal people, there's been an uprising no. and there's been a a swell of sort of hum, like humanity amongst normal people in a way that I've never seen before about that particular sort of issue where they kind of say this is wrong and and 
in terms of looking positives, like I will even where, wherever possible, um, I I always try and share situations where where Israelis are sort of um, protesting against the war, and and even if it's like a small group of people because of they've got like a um, they're trying to sort of um, dampen any sort of um, uh, opposition to the war. Like they, they are still willing to fight. You're still getting um, yeah. conscientious objectors, like teenagers, right. teenagers who have got no sort of um, power in their world. They are, they are conscientiously objecting to going to war and being conscripted. And that's, that's sort of the, the little moments of beauty and the little moments of hope that you kind of search for. And even in a, even in a football sense, this is why I love Cantona because you talk about Muslims and as Muslims, we we kind of like always try and right the wrongs. We always try and sort of um, stick up for ourselves and try and explain that 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 our religion is not one of hate, and we just want to live peacefully as everyone else. But then when you get you get someone like Eric Cantona, who has got no skin in the game really, and he has been so vocal about um, how Muslims are treated and how they're depict, de depicted, and He's done it at the most unfashionable times. Like um, there's a, there's a quote that I use in the book where he kind of uh, it kind of really resonated with with my feelings about, about about the situation where he said, "What does the what does what does moderate Muslim mean? Like what does that phrase mean? It's a, he what he called it was a latent provocation, which it is. He's basically saying, and and I, I completely agree. If you're saying that someone is okay because they're a moderate Muslim, mm -hmm. then what you're saying is 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 they they are Muslim but not too much. So therefore, being Muslim is bad, and being any more Muslim than that is bad, and being a full Muslim is is unacceptable. So that's why it's a provocation, and that's because I'm 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 fully Muslim. Like I I am proud to be Muslim, and and like the the fact that I've got a book out called Inshallah United, sort of uh, is testament to that. Like I I am I'm so proud to be Muslim. It, it sort of um it feeds into every part of my life. It kind of um. It really uh, gives me a sense of how I should treat other people and how how I should be good and be kind to people yeah. and and it, it sort of, it sort of affects every decision decision I make and I'm I'm not ashamed of that because I see it as a really positive thing in my life and and I think I think that's what I really appreciated about someone like Cantona coming out and saying it where it was a case of um, being fully Muslim being being totally Muslim. It's a beautiful thing. Like it's it's in the same way, being fully Jewish or being fully Catholic or being fully humanist or, or, or and and having having no uh, affiliation to an organised religion is beautiful as long as you are a good person. Um, I, I completely agree with this, and I'm yeah. someone I'm I'm an atheist, but my view on this, and I've said this to my kid, is I'm confident but not certain about anything. Okay, so I have a particular view, but it gives me no superiority over anyone. It does not make me, you know, a, 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 you know, more intellectual than anyone. It doesn't make me better than anyone. And do I believe that if all religion ended tomorrow, we'd be living in a kumbaya world where we would not be executing each other? No, you know, anyone, human beings would invent other stories to do this. Um, this is not a consequence of religion. This is a consequence of the human. Right, bottom line. So to me, you know, again, we judge things from the fringes. There is communities all over the world that don't get hurt. We have a community here. We have an imam and a rabbi here from the mosque and from the um, synagogue. They do community work every single week together, right? And there's stories like this that goes on everywhere. There's tremendous work goes on in, in, in religious communities of people doing tremendous sacrifices, Catholic, Protestant, uh, Jewish people. doesn't matter. These are people with good hearts. They don't understand that at its core, religion is saying the same thing, right? That there's um, about, a, about loving each other, about accepting each other, about... You know, to me, every view that I have is derivative of the fact that every human life is equal. I don't care what your nationality is, what your identity is. We all feel the same. We hurt the same. We cry the same. We love our kids the same. We have the same instinct to protect our families. And we're all entitled to the same inalienable rights. Once we start inferring there's a value placed on a human being 
based on certain identities, then we're not a million miles away from the ideology that permits your slaughter based on your identity. And that has been used to justify the most abhorrent or boring apex of human cruelty throughout human history. And it, the only thing that changes is the protagonist and the victim, right? That's it. And those that say, I'm a good guy, but I can permit this once, there's no such place, right? Because once we plan equivalent standards to all human beings, it's not permissible anywhere for exactly the same reason that the people who were murdered on October the 7th is a crime against humanity, right? Because these are innocent human beings like you, like me, that want the same thing, that want a little bit of peace, a little bit of prosperity, the right to raise their kids in an environment where they can thrive, a little bit of comfort, and then we dignity and die. That's it, right? And I think every human being should be entitled to that, right? And there's nobody should be allowed to take that from someone. So to me, I just, I, I, I don't know. I just, th we have a little bit of that, like get back to what we're saying in the Manchester Native community where those, you know, um, you know, identifiers disappear and we um, unify under one community. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about a couple of chapters and don't have to take too much more of your time. But um, one of the things that I found really, really fascinating was your complex view of United Legends um, and uh, how Hey, uh, zero sum we can be. You can be a legend and then go play for Manchester City, and all of a sudden it dissolves everything that you did, that you've done. You wrote stuff about Schmeichel, about Mark Hughes, and I was absolutely like borderline obsessed with Mark Hughes as a child. You know, just he was born November first. I was November second. Back then, of every shoot magazine, every match magazine, absolutely obsessed with him, um, and. Uh, you're right when he went to Chelsea. He said a few things about Chelsea being his boyhood club and stuff that broke my heart. Uh, Schmeichel, I've interviewed him. I've talked to him about this. Um, disappointed with his cartwheel too. But in many ways, it shows the complex relationship we have with our heroes. That's completely it. And, and, and again, like um, I felt the same about, about Hughes. Like... Um... Mm. Even the way he looked, he he looked like a like comic book yeah. hero, like like the massive thighs and the way he played. Um, it was and the goals he scored, like 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 people talk about Zlatan now in terms of like his athleticism. Um, back then, kind of like Hughes was doing things that you kind of the thing with Zlatan is is he's got the kind of body and he's lithe and and like he's he's got the limbs and everything where you you can kind of see him doing the extraordinary things and kind of think well that makes sense for his body type hughes was built like a brick shit house and yet Wait, ball from mark robbins how long did we yeah. talk about luca morbid's ah, doing that mark robbins mark that in 1990 the outside boom, boom right on the mark robbins head i mean unbelievable oh in in incredible so but but but, but what, I, what i find really interesting is is the fact that there are some there are some sort of uh, feelings you can have about about your favorite footballers that you can explain. Um, like like Cantona is is an obvious one. There's so many reasons to love Cantona, and and it's got to the point now where he's such a legend that mm. I even see staunch Liverpool fans and fans of other clubs saying like, "I hate United, but Cantona's <laughs> sound." Like and 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 that's that's testament to to sort of how. Mm cool he is how sort of um how how sort of righteous he is in terms of his views and everything but then you have other players and 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 it's hard to explain why you feel the way you do about them good or bad like one one player that i well well a couple of players first of all i i wish we had a player like van nistelrooy now like yeah. I, I i always think I, i've always thought of him as an amazing player and in a lot of ways um in spite of the fact he's so highly rated, I still think he's underrated. But having said that, and again, I've got no problem with him, nothing against him. But I wonder, like, why why isn't he a like? Why didn't United fans take him to their hearts more than they did? Mm -hmm. It's a strange one. And and and, and then you've got you've got a, I think you've got a slightly more extreme example of like someone like um, Rio Ferdinand is possibly the best defender Manchester United have ever had. Like that's an argument that you can make. Yep. Um, I, I never felt any affiliation with him. Like mm. he, he, even in his playing days, forget forget the, the the time he was kind of flirting with Chelsea. Even before then, like I I, I just never had a connection, and, and that's that's nothing really to do with him. But it's I just find it strange how you can 
as a fan, you can have you you can have an incredible um, connection with with a player, or or have zero connection with another player, and 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 it sometimes it's got it makes no sense, and it's it's almost that thing of like uh, even in sort of romantic relationships, you don't you don't choose who you love, you don't choose who you fall in love with, and it's almost like that with football yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's what that's why you get cult heroes. That's why you get the whole point of a cult hero is 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 it's a it's a player that for whatever reason the fans latch onto, and it's not because he's the best player. It's just because there's there's a strange connection that that sort of it's it's plays like why why do people to this day still sort of like have this um, intense sort of uh, memory and and sort of fondness for Remy Moses, mm-hmm. like the like. If you look at like if in football terms, like like in a lot of ways, an underrated player, um, tenacious and, and and everything, but like he he was loved beyond what he should have been uh, in a logical sense, and it's and it's hard to comprehend. And and there's other players like um, Kevin Moran is another player that that that, that was loved. Um, I'm trying to think of a modern modern like people are really fond of Veron. Mm-hmm. Or, or even like like Karol Pavorsky or or Diego Forlan, and it doesn't always make sense, but you just know that you feel that connection to them in in some way. Yeah, I think for me, you know, obviously it depends on your age and where you're at and your perspective in life. But um, to me, a guy with average ability is much more endearing to me if they are going give a hundred percent. They don't do not above themselves. There's still people that have a relationship with the fans. There aren't people that are you know don't get near me. You know, um, in some sense I felt more of an endearment towards average players than I did towards Ronaldo because there's, there's a certain aloofness there where this feels just like a job. And I'm out the first time, you know, it, it 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 is not expedient to me. Then my relationship with him is different. But if you're someone that you know gives you a hundred percent every week, that um, plays like a fan would, that can be endearing to me. But I accept that there's lots of, um, you know, the 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 there's lots of um, examples that would make me a hypocrite on that. But I, I don't maybe, know the exact maybe, answer. Maybe it's just it's just that sense of um, people just. I think human beings um, just instinctively have like a, a sixth sense about who they should care about and who they shouldn't, and that's why that's why it's really hard to bluff people. That's why it's really hard to sort of uh, over time con people into thinking you're a good person or, or you care because yeah. sooner, sooner or later people can just work you out. Your accents always speak better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about um, young Zidane Baum because he ends up coming uh, play for Manchester United. How important for you as a Muslim Asian to see someone that um, from your background playing for Manchester United? Oh, it was it was incredible, and and, and I mean, if I'd if I'd have had uh, someone to latch onto like that. When I was a kid, it would have meant the world to me, and yeah. and I see I see in my in, in my nieces and nephews like like they're they're now getting ingratiated into football mainly sort of due to due to sort of me, and and, and it's um like th- th- they love that, and 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 uh, even even though like it perhaps looks as if long term um, his future was elsewhere, then that's fine, like because he's he's met, he's 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 made that mark and if yes. enough players make that mark and those things tot up like occasionally uh, like like eventually you will have a player who breaks through um and and if there's if there's enough, if there's enough talented players knocking at the door then then one of them will break through and then you'll have a superstar and i just think i just think it's to this day i think it's ridiculous that in such a multicultural country uh forget muslim like you, we've not had um, an Asian superstar in the England team, like why not? It's it's ridiculous, and I, I sort of go into it in the book, and like there's all sorts of excuses about like, oh maybe it's the physique, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's the strength. You only have to have a look at the amount of boxes, Asian boxes. Yeah, that, I, that was cool. I was thinking about this Prince Nassim yeah. or lots of them. Yeah. Oh, that's, um, it, that's it. Yeah. So, so, so the whole physicality thing is 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 a, is a 
a red herring, and, and and you only have to look at like like um. It, There's it's prejudice been, even built into that assumption. You know, oh, yeah. you hear out here about young black men. You know, their physique is what allows them to be so successful exactly. in American football. This is this is prejudice at its core. You know, yeah. even if people are conscious of it, it's you know, are you saying that uh, Wake has the perfect physique? Yeah, and you and you and and you're not telling me that that uh, Jasper Olsen or or Gordon yeah. Strachan or, or Phil Bowden or Paul Scholes yeah. are, like, are like perfect sort of examples of like of like masculine physiques that they could make. No, it it's, and just stupid. it's just it's yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it will happen. It will inevitably happen. But it's that it's like that thing about sort of wanting the book to sort of inspire uh, like kids, like Muslim kids in the future to to do something like that. As soon as you see it happening, you feel that that it can happen for you as well. So. I just think as, as soon as a little bit like like I mean I write about Prince Nassim in the book in in terms of like he 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 was actually Yemeni so so Middle Eastern but mm -hmm. in in every sense to me he just felt like a Pakistani Pakistani kid just like me so that, that's then yes. I, I think I think his success um, opened the door for a whole generation of, of of like Asian kids who wanted to take up boxing and then and then you saw the success of that and you you see the success of that to this day so. The same will happen to football. Like as soon as you get the first Asian football superstar, like you'll get you, you then you'll get a whole generation that will come after them. I'm sure. I think one of the things about Nassim was that was going back to what we were saying earlier was he, was he became a superstar whilst also making sure that a big part of his identity was that he was a proud Muslim. You know, it wasn't yeah. something that he had to suppress. You know, you saw what Muhammad Ali went through, right? Um, so he, he was unashamed about who he was um, and what, um, you know, prejudices were leveled at him because he was so good that um, he was able to tell other Asian kids, if you, whatever level you make to in life, or, or, or Muslim kids, or, you know, um, Yemeni, or whatever you whatever your background is, if your religion does not have to be suppressed. You know, um, Mike Tyson now is uh, a proud Muslim. You know, I've had the, I've been spent some time in Mike's company, deeply spiritual guy. Uh, Devin Haney, the fights tomorrow night against Ryan Garcia, proud Muslim. Now, all of a sudden, you know, this is not something that uh, you need to pretend doesn't exist so that young kids can be proud and secure in their identity. I think that doesn't matter whether you're, you know, Muslim, Jewish, doesn't matter, right? Because that, to me, is not an important determiner of who you are. It's all about how you treat other people. And, um, yeah, I think um, that, that brings up a good point. I want to ask you about your dad because you brought something up there that's very important. Um you lost your dad uh, when you were 15, is that correct? Uh, a, a little bit later, I was, I was, I was 18. 18? So yeah. tell me a bit about that. Well, I mean, so essentially it was a, it was a case of um, he, 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 was, he was having like bad health for, for a while, sort of, uh, and, and he was like kind of forced to, to retire. Um, and then, yeah, he, he had a, a stroke and then um there was there was bleeding in mm. in the head and he went into essentially um, he was rushed to hospital after after a stroke and then over about a two week period he he deteriorated from recognizing us to uh um just being able to squeeze our hands to slowly um uh deteriorating and then and then passing away and uh, in 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 a this this feels like a really strange thing to say, and 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 I I kind of acknowledged this in the book that um one of my I don't even know if proud is the right word, but one of my proudest kind of moments was in my life is that I was there when when he died, like I, mm. I was I was there by his side in the hospital when and I saw him breathe his last breath, and then and then he died, and and mm. and I feel I feel sort of humbled and sort of proud that I could have been there for him for that moment. Um, and yeah, and then and then what what that essentially means is, especially because we because we had no uncles or aunties or cousins or anything or grandparents in this in this country. Um, like I, I, I kind of de facto became like the man of the house, if you want to call it that. I mean, I had two older sisters who were incredible mm -hmm. and were so much uh, more 
emotionally mature than me and sort of dealt with it a lot better than me but like a lot of the a lot of the burden sort of um, was put on my shoulders to sort of deal with things and carry the family forward and and look after my siblings and my mom and and again you you talk about um things you're most proud of in life mm-hmm. And it's not about making money. It's not no. about um, I've got this job or I got this promotion. The things that you should be most proud about is what you've done for other people in life. And like I, I hope that I've always been there for for my family and, and the people I love and my mom and and my brothers and sisters and 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 now my nieces and nephews and and that's that's what's important. Like like I'm. I think I think for me over time I grew into being that that person that people turn to and sort of speak to and and ask for help and everything and and I'm and like it got to it's got to a stage now where I'm that's that's who I am and I'm comfortable to be that but it was uh, it was tough it was tough sort of like uh, as a teenager suddenly suddenly realizing that um it's on you and mm-hmm. if you're if you're struggling at any point in your life if you're sort of doubting yourself if you're sort of feeling full of despair there's no one older than than you that you can go to yeah. there's no da- there's no dad that you can say like mm-hmm. i don't i don't know what i'm doing in this situation yeah. like help help me like yeah. like um there's okay. there was no there's no one like that but um but again like like you you find the strength in in the things that are important to you and and uh football was really important at that time football becomes more important um in the tough times because it becomes that release and that and that escape and you turn to your friends you 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 you, you gain you you sort of garner strength from your family um and and you just you just do it because you, you do it because you because you kind of have to and, and 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 obviously for me a big thing was was my religion and my faith and yeah. okay like and, and i appreciate for a lot of people um especially if, if if they aren't sort of um they don't have a religion or they, or they don't have a faith like i completely appreciate and I, and I respect anyone sort of whether they've got any faith or no faith and mm-hmm. and just sort of like i've got a belief system of just being a good human like a like yeah. respect well, that. Listen, what, if you find solace you find comfort you find inspiration in your faith you, you don't know an explanation that's anybody. it that's it. So so, 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 from my point of view, and I, and I know for a lot of people like who don't believe in God, they they think, well, you just you just believe in a fairy tale. But, but that's just another form of prejudice because nobody. Knows I know, anything. I know, I know, nobody I know, knows. I know. I mean, he, 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 you look at even the basic principles of quantum mechanics. I mean, hmm. we don't anesthesiologists doesn't know how anesthetic works because we don't know how you're conscious. You know, uh, we look at, um, you know, t- when when classical physics, you know, uh, the turn of the 20th century were, were claiming that we, um, you know, pretty much discovered everything there is to discover in, in physics, just a matter of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. This is before quantum physics was even discovered. And then we realized that, you know what? We have no idea what collapses the wave function from superposition into, you know, consensus reality. A snake looks at a wall, sees infrared. You and I look at a wall, see something totally different. The behavior, you know, of particles of, you know, uh, conjugate variables. We we don't know how to measure. You know, if you want to measure a particle, you can't know its its speed, or you can only know its location, or you can only know its speed, and you know. The speed of light apparently is the, is the fastest thing in the universe. But if we split particles in reverse their spin, they 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 mirror each other exactly the same speed, faster than the speed of light. So that means our quantum entanglement we're connected forever. I mean, uh, science determinism is working off the same premise. Give me one free miracle and explain the world because quantum you know uh, or, or, or uh, vacuum energy can explain the big bang but doesn't explain information and so there's a you know we have to be humble in our you know our understanding that I think one thing that is really interesting about humanity is even privileged uh, primitive civilizations who weren't in contact with each other all developed a belief in something greater than themselves and didn't matter where human beings were, they always believed in some, whether it was monotheism or polytheism, it doesn't matter. There was always a belief. And 
no science, science is nowhere near even giving you a mathematical equation to explain why we eat chocolate and it doesn't taste like bread. I have no fucking idea, right? So, you know, there's a lot that we have to be humble about, about ourselves, but, you know, about, you know, about our experience in the world and, um, and, and, you know, being claiming as deterministic and saying that we're just a bunch of organisms. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know what the truth is, to be honest. Um, and I think that the universe is obviously smarter than us because we're clearly not smarter than the universe and our intelligence and our experience. I mean, if I was born blind and I said, you describe the color green to me, you never could. Because yeah. it's just, those are just symbols. You have to experience something. And I think that that, that matters. And I think you have to be humble about... Well, well that's the thing. Like, I think that's key. I think uh, I think that word humble is, is like at the centre of so much of, of what we're talking about. Because, and again, like it's, it's that thing of like, I didn't have a dad to turn to and I spent yeah. books, but I did have God. Like, mm -hmm. like, like I, I could, five times a day, I could pray and I could speak yeah. to God and I could help me through this like i don't know how i don't know what i'm doing i don't know how i'm, how I'm going to cope with this but help me deal with this and that gave me solace and this seems this seems like such a sort of um daft pop culture pop culture reference but it's almost like like dumbo and and and, and the feather like mm -hmm. if that if that's the thing that made him believe that he could fly like, yeah. like that that had worth and it's, Absolutely. And, it's like, and it's and it's that thing of like if you I think I think it's always healthy in life to realize that this this thing's bigger than you, and whether that's whether that's God, whether that's yeah. other, uh, 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 another form of spirituality, whether that's just society, whether that's, that's believing that you are part of society and that's fundamental to who you are, and it's not just life is not just individualistic and and sort of it's not it's not a competition of like I've got to win and you've got to lose. No. If you can feel part of something bigger than you are, even even something like football, if you can believe that uh, you are a small part of something bigger, not only does that make you feel as if you belong in some fundamental way, but like you say, it gives you a sense of humility. It gives you a sense of, I am not the centre of the world. I, I'm part of the world. Mate, this is exactly how I feel and why I don't like prejudice at all. I think that the apple isn't played in the seat. And you've just all seed and that we are as much a part of the universe as the sun and the stars. And you take a cup of water out of the ocean, take a little drop, the whole world. ocean is in that little drop of water. And I think that's what we all are. We're all a massive part of the universe and that we are all supposed to be here. Um, last question, do you, when you're grief for your dad, uh, do you grieve what you lost or do you grieve what you didn't get to experience? I mean, over time, you try and be philosophical about it, um, and uh, and 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 I, the way I look at it is, is I didn't get to have that time with him that I wish I had because um, I think it's I think it's a special time. Sorry, I'm go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's a special time when when you are an adult as well as your yes. parents because you can speak to them on a level that you couldn't as a child. Yes. Um, and and obviously I didn't have that with my dad because just as I, as I was on the cusp of a reaching that level, um, like I lost him. But then I kind of think, well, I had him for as long as I needed him, and I, and I'm so grateful that I had him for that that amount of time. And what it does do is not only does it make you great, grateful for what you had, but it makes you determined to make your existent existence worthwhile for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and 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 I find it, and again, like you look for positives in the world. I find it amazing how many, some of the, some of the most amazing people that I have ever met have gone through immeasurable hardship, mm -hmm. and some of the best fathers and best mothers and best parents that I have ever met were not treated nicely by their own. And I think you can learn good things, and you can and and, and you can learn from good things, and you can learn from bad things, but. Um, it's that thing. It's, it's it, and, and it's a stereotype, but it's true. Of like, the most interesting people that I've ever met are the other people who have who have struggled most with the mental health, or 
gone through difficulties or faced addiction or or or, for, or faced sort of um, tragic circumstances because those are the people who have who have experienced those situations and got through it and learned something from it and have been shaped by it and that's 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 why um even hardship um as as difficult as it can seem it's can sometimes be its own kind of blessing and it can it can not only can it make you a stronger person and make you a better person and make you a more um humanitarian in terms of your outlook but it can also um affect other people because you 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 learn not to be what you don't want to be and you're yes. kinder and nicer to to the, the next generation or the next people you meet yeah no there's no doubt when you have an intimate relationship with suffering um you never want to uh be ignorant to someone else's or in order to be the cause of it um mate <clears throat> you are your father's legacy um you have Every day you're doing proud. You're someone that I am really glad I've got to know. Um, you're someone that I've had tremendous respect and admiration for for years, um, for your humor, um, for your sensitivity, for your um, you know the the, the the your growth as a person that I've seen over years because we've known each other a long time. Contribution you make to the United community, the contribution to you make to people who have a similar background to you who need voices like yourself to help the next generation coming up so that they can do the same so that this can get normalized and so that they feel that they're included and there's people exactly like them um that um you know are also a voice to them and there's very few people that are more eloquent and better place to speak than yourself um i highly recommend folks you get this book it's a brilliant read um and if you're someone of our generation that grew up watching united you will be taking on a walk down memory lane if you're not read it and know what it was like to be there fantastic experience brilliant book i will post links to it for you to download and um man, i would love to get you back absolutely fantastic thank you for having me so thank you for coming on oh thank you so much and and, and like i said uh it's uh it's it's the first uh first real conversation we've had, but like it, it feels like talking to an old friend and uh and, and yeah, like uh everything everything that you've said, like uh I mean uh, it's it's the same for me. Like I I really appreciate sort of um the, the I mean e even even up to the current day, like 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 uh you will share sentiments about what's happening in the world and yeah. uh quite often it'll be unpopular sentiments that you that you know will get your heat but like you, you stand by your principles and you're and you're shaped by what's happening in your, in your life and the difficulties you faced in your life in such a beautiful positive way and uh and yeah um it's all reciprocated Mate, I'm not a I'm on a clumsy order sometimes we say things that uh, I probably could be better at but my ultimate sentiment is I just want to live in a world that doesn't um use a flim as this pretext to slaughter each other because um you know something that I was reading in your book that uh, is pertinent to this was when you were walking through cemeteries reading um different headstones of people that lived short lives long lives the fact that someone loved them um, to put that there and the grief and suffering that we impose on each other due to some sense of superiority and legitimacy is is a ma major major mistake and none of us are free until all of us are free and we have equitable respect for each other and love for each other and i think that is achievable i think one of the reasons why we don't achieve it is because powerful people have incentives not to achieve it and they use it as a tool of division and I look at my own community where Catholic and Protestant once seemed impossible to grow together and to learn that we have so much in common that um, and all those divisions are being eroded now because the incentive to keep them is disappearing. And um, I, do, I, I don't want to live in a world that justifies your death or the death of your children um, on some ridiculous sense of righteousness or mine or, or anyone's for that matter. Um, it's just insane. But... Yeah. That's all it is, um, and um, uh, you're quite right that the, some of the bravest people that have spoken up against this, you know, 
or people who would benefit from not speaking up about it and Jewish people who have been incredibly brave and faint in their voice say this does this is not my name I'm not defined by this in exactly the same way the governments use their people um, uh, and make them culpable for their crimes. This is not people, this is governments. Mate, thank you so much for everything. Um, and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I know it's Friday night, Friday afternoon for me. So I will let you get back to your evening, have a brilliant weekend, and hopefully you need to get a win on Sunday. Brilliant, you too. Hey, not even silly, mate, bye.